Good morning, Sanctuary Church. Hallelujah. Hope you're comfortable in your casual clothes today. Let's also enter into the comfort of His presence with worship and praise. Let's give Him the glory He deserves. Hallelujah. Not enough words to ever say what I found Wonderful and beautiful and glorious and holy He is merciful and powerful Who are we talking about? That's my King We declare the glory Give Him all the honor All together worthy Who are we talking about? That's my King There's no one before you Yes, we will adore you. All of this is for you. Who are we talking about? That's my king. Jesus, you're my king. Yeah. I'm not letting the rocks cry without joining the chorus. You're on enough notes to make the heart moan. testify that he's the king of kings can anybody testify he's the king of addiction he can break it he can pull you out he's the king over your depression if you're here today and you need something I can tell you we know who the king is somebody shout his name King Jesus the one we serve the one that died for us the one that was raised again so that we could have everlasting life one more time just clap your hand unto the king Lord, we worship you today. We magnify the name of Jesus. We gather together to lift you up, Lord. Somebody just say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Welcome to Sanctuary Church of Jonesboro. We are so happy you joined us. At this time, you can make your way back to your seat. You may have noticed it's already been pointed out by Brother Lauren, but 
We're in our casual dress today. Somebody say amen. I love it. I love taking advantage of this casual dress. A few people didn't get the memo. <clears throat> Bishop. Oh, hang on. Sister E wants to say something. Pastor. She's saying pastor didn't get the memo either this morning. That's all right, though. We're here today casual because we have something we're looking forward to, and that is the Section 5 Fun Day at the park. Immediately following service, we invite you. It's at East Craighead Forest Park. If you don't know where that is, you can come speak to me. You can look it up on your phone, or if you need somebody to help you get there, find somebody that knows where they're going, and you can just follow there with them. They're going to serve food. They're going to have barbecue, hot dogs, all the fixings. And then also Section 5 Youth is selling drinks there. They're taking donations. So we want to support our section. We want to support our youth with Move the Mission. So if you go, take a drink, drop a donation in there. I'm sure they'll appreciate it. They take cash, check, or cash app. And all the ladies in the house say this upcoming weekend is Arkansas District Ladies Conference. We're excited that Sanctuary Church of Jonesboro is going to be well represented in our ladies department. So we're looking forward to that. And then April 26th, the Move the Mission kickoff rally. We're so privileged that Section 5 is allowing Sanctuary Church to host one. We're also privileged that our uh, Sanctuary Church of Jonesboro choir will be singing at that. So we're excited, looking forward to that. That service will be at 7 p.m. again here on location. And we have Reverend Frank Jordan joining us. If you've not heard him preach, he's a phenomenal man of God, but he's also a phenomenal preacher. We encourage you. It's not only youth. It's a youth-focused service, yes, but we want everybody to come to it. So if you're available Friday night, April 26, 7 p.m., come join us and cheer our kids on as they worship the Lord. Also, a big date coming up, and I was made sure to point this one out by Sister E, Sister Joelle, Sister Lauren. May 12th is Mother's Day. Husbands, don't miss it. Sons, daughters, don't miss it. Mother's Day coming up May 12th. It's going to be a great time. We're so privileged that May 5th and May 12th, we're having Sammy Cheryl, an evangelist, going to be with us. And for the month of May, it's going to be revival month. So if you need something from the Lord, you need to be in the house of God. If you know somebody that needs something, invite them for revival month, May 5th and May 12th with Sammy Cheryl. We're looking forward to it. Also, today, if you're a guest, we want you to know how much you've blessed us just by joining us, bringing yourselves. We're so thankful you're here. We want you to feel welcome. There's a QR code in between the seats that you can scan, and it pulls up different information. If our hospitality team didn't get to greet you or meet you, please let us know. We've got a gift for you. We just want you to feel welcome today. But more than anything, we want you to know that you're a blessing to us. Amen. We're glad you're here. Also, if you have your offering and tithes, you can give via the Church Center app. You can download the Church Center app. There's a few ways you can give. You see on the screen, you can text the number 84321. And there's also a drop box out in the foyer. We're so excited about that. And now if you will turn your attention to the screen for a special presentation. Hi, I'm Tim here at Seven Recovery at Sanctuary. And today we want to share an example of what God has done in the lives of people just like you every Tuesday night at recovery. Hi, my name is Amber and I am in recovery for stress, anxiety, um, pride, overthinking, eating disorders, and control issues. I started out coming to Seven Recovery. Uh, I was somewhat aware of it from um, another church that I was going to before I got married. So I knew that it was a good ministry and I knew that it was something that I really wanted to be involved with. But I wasn't coming to recovery very long before I realized that there was a lot of things that I needed recovery for. I think part of my fault was that because I am, I am a Christian, that I thought I knew how to handle things. You know, we, we know how to pray, we know how to fast, we know that the Holy Ghost is our comforter, we pray and we, we read the Bible and we, we know how to be comforted. But even though sometimes I think I know how to handle everything, there's some things that I thought I had handled and I, I didn't. That there's just this extra step in coming and talking and being in a, a room full of people that have problems just like you, you realize like, I'm okay. It's okay to be a Christian and have faults. Like it's okay to be Christian and, and have self-inflicted things that you've gone through that it's fine. So that was just something that I had to overcome and the, the pride of me just thought that I had it covered 
and the Lord really opened my eyes that sometimes you just need a little bit more even though the Lord shows up and he does a miracle and he rescues you and he does a lot of things for you sometimes that miracle is just the starting point of your process and and I thought and I didn't know that I, I've learned a lot through being here so James 5:16 says that if we confess our faults and we pray then we are healed and I just don't think that the Lord would deliver us from things to just let us dwell in that. I, I think that we need to keep coming back because we're never, we're never healed from something to just stay there. We, we need to keep coming so that we can keep on top of our healing, but also pray for others that they get the same thing. And we can't pray for others if we don't keep showing up. I would definitely encourage anybody to at least come to Seven Recovery and keep coming. Don't just come once. I came several months before I realized that I just needed this more than I thought I did. So I would say keep coming and try more than once because before you know it, the Lord's gonna show you some stuff <laughs> and you're gonna, be, you're gonna be a lot better for it in the end, I promise. I thank God for what He's done and is doing through Seven Recovery here at Sanctuary. Every Tuesday night, they meet. 5.45, they have a meal. 6.30, they have their big group. And after that, they go to small groups. And it's a healing place. And that's appropriate because this is a place of healing. Matter of fact, let me just tell you, wherever you came from today, whatever you might have been battling or facing, this is a safe place for all people. You have come to the right place today because God is here and God can do anything. And today could be the start, as Sister Amber said on that video, today could be the start of your miracle. This could be the day where everything begins to change for you. And if you believe that, why don't you just give God a hand clap, hand clap of praise today. You're going to see some names on the screen this morning. We're going to go to the Lord together in prayer. Um, there is a name that I would like to make specific mention of. Uh, Thirteen and a half years ago, we moved to Jonesboro. Was Sam there already? Thirteen and a half years ago, we moved to Jonesboro. And that was a big deal for our family because we didn't really know a lot of people and and um, it, was, it was obviously a great big change for us. And one of the things that we had fleeced the Lord, that if this would be your will for us to move to Jonesboro and plant this church that you're sitting in today, was, Lord, you could allow for my wife, Sister E, as we affectionately call her, you could allow for Erica's job to transfer her here. And so we prayed about it, and they did that. And so when we moved here, she moved into a new office, met a whole lot of new people. One of those people was a woman by the name of Samantha Wally. You see her name on the screen this morning. Uh, Sam is about the same age as Sister E. Uh, she has a son that is just a couple months younger than Asher. They went to pre-K together and has been probably my wife's best friend at her job. And she had a cardiac event last Wednesday and um, they worked on her for 30 minutes and without being able to get a pulse right now, she's on life support. And all of, all of modern medicine and technology says that, that she's no longer with us, that for all intents and purposes, she's gone. And we were able to go up there. We were out of town when we found out and heard the news. And um, we got home yesterday and dropped the kids off at the house and turned around and went straight to the hospital and saw her in-laws there. And my wife prayed over her, and I, I stood there with them. And they're all hurting quite a bit today, and I don't know why things work out the way they do, but I will tell you that I just still believe in miracles I believe God could do something special and he could do it for his namesake 
Whether he chooses to or not, that'll be his business. But we want to pray for Samantha today, and we want to pray for their family, and particularly a young boy today that's hurting very bad. It was a very traumatic, unexpected event with no warning. So please keep them in prayer. I know there's many other needs represented here today. If you have one, you could just signify it by raising a hand. Many needs represented. And it's our custom here that we stand together at this moment. And could you join me in doing that? And we're going to pray together. And when we pray, this is how we pray. We pray the prayer. Everybody say the prayer of faith. We're going to pray the prayer of faith today. And the prayer of faith is beyond the prayer of human reasoning. It's beyond the prayer of human understanding or intellectualism. The prayer of faith goes beyond our own abilities or the abilities of any other person. It goes into the hands of the Almighty God. And whatever you brought today, if we can pray a prayer of faith, there's a God who can move and minister on behalf of every need. So let's join our hearts, our voices, and our hands together, and let's call on Him. Would you do that? In the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we reach out to you right now. We reach beyond this world that we are in. We reach beyond this, the, the confines of this flesh that we are in. We reach beyond the limitations of our own understanding and ingenuity. And Lord, we call upon you because we know that you are above it all, that you are beyond it all. You already know in from beginning Today we call on the mighty, matchless name of Jesus Christ. Your name is greater than the names of cancer. Your name is greater than the name of heart disease. Your name is greater, Lord. And there's people in this room right now, they didn't even lift a hand for themselves. They lifted it for somebody else. But I believe I just felt prompted in my spirit, Lord, to say that while we're praying for somebody else, you're going to touch somebody here today. And you're going to work a miracle in their life. And we're going to give you praise and glory and honor in the mighty name of Jesus. The mighty name of Jesus. Would you do me a favor and would you just turn and smile and greet two or three people and tell them how glad you are to be in church with them today?
and I don't ever want to forget who he is, his majesty, how great he is, how awesome he is, truly the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He rules and he reigns. And yet he loves me. And yet he listens to me when I pray. What an amazing, amazing gift that the God of all creation loves us so much. I heard a song this week and the bridge just touched my heart and I can't get away from it. It said, his goodness has been, his goodness will be, his goodness has never depended on me. So I know I have a testimony of his goodness and I know every single person in this room has a testimony of his goodness. So this morning, I want us just to think about the goodness of our God. What has he done for you? Every time he's made a way when there seemed to be no way, every time he gave you something you asked for and you wanted with all your heart, thank you, Jesus, for my Asher and my Nora. I never want to forget what he's done for me, for saving my soul, for filling me with his spirit, for making a way in my life, for me to know him in the power of his resurrection. He has been so good. And I don't want us to take that for granted. Can you lift a hand and remember the goodness of the Lord? Thank you, Jesus. When I think about the Lord, how he saved me, how he raised me, how he filled me with the Holy Ghost, how he healed me to the
Now, we've done it with music, but I wonder if there's anybody that's got a shout you don't have to be primed for. you just like to give a praise to God. Would you just lift that up? Hallelujah! Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I will say of the Lord. And then he started saying, I wonder if there's anybody here today that says, I can say of the Lord. He's a refuge. He's a strong tower. He's a healer. He's a deliverer. He's a way maker. He's an encourager. He's a blesser. He's a keeper. He's a, he's a captain of the Lord's army. He goes before me. He goes behind me. He's the beginning. He's the end. He is good. He is merciful. He is kind. Well, go ahead and praise him for it. Yes, hallelujah. Mm, yes. I ain't going to sing. I know I lied. I feel like praising, praising Him. Said I feel like praising, praising Him. I will praise Him in the morning. Praise Him all day long. I feel like praising, praising Him. Said I feel like praising. I said, why do you do that so much? Well, there's a couple reasons. One is, I like to. And I just so happen to be the pastor. And so it works out pretty good. But number two, I want our young people to hear some of those songs too. And I love all the new we do and I love all the old. And I'm glad we got it all together in this church. And I thank God for great people around here who lead us in worship. (laughs) Second Timothy chapter number four is where I'm going today. Second Timothy chapter four, if you'd remain standing for the reading of the word. As soon as this service is over, you, you can head on out to pavilions three and four at Craighead, and that means when you, when you come out or, or when you pull into Craighead, when you get to that roundabout, you'll want to go to the left. You'll want to go to your left, and pavilions three and four will be down there. And the food, by the way, is free. The food is free. You could bring a drink, or the young people are selling those drinks out there to raise money for Move the Mission. And uh, bring your chair if you've got one. There's other seats there too. But there will be a lot of people out there. And we can have a great time fellowshipping with the body of Christ. Amen. Second Timothy 4 and 6. The Bible says, this is the Apostle Paul speaking to Timothy. He said, for I am now ready to be offered. And the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only but unto all them that also love His appearing. My subject to you today is what the old man said to the young man. What the old man said 
to the young man. Let's pray together. Ask the Lord to bless his word today. In the mighty name of Jesus, we come to you, Lord. We know that it's possible to have ears but not hear. We know it's possible, Lord, to have a heart but it not understand. So I pray today that we would have ears to hear and hearts to understand what your spirit says to us. Help us, Lord. I pray that you would help us to be solidified in some things and we would be helped in our spirit to continue on. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. God bless you. You may be seated. There's an interesting dynamic between the author of this letter that I've read to you from today and to the recipient after whom it is named. Timothy was near and dear to the heart of the Apostle Paul. Matter of fact, he considered him to be, along with Titus, he considered him to be a son in the gospel to him. Though Timothy was not his son after bloodline, he said, in the spiritual sense, I am a father to you, and you, Timothy, are a son unto me. And so there's a closeness between the two of them that doesn't just always exist. Matter of fact, when Paul wrote to the church at Galatia, he didn't write to them with quite the same, maybe, compassion that he did to Timothy. When he wrote to Timothy, he called him my dearly beloved son. When he wrote to the Galatians, he called them, oh, foolish Galatians. But you see, with Timothy, it was a little, it was a little bit closer than that. I want to just stop there for a moment to say thank God that he has given us people they may not be your natural born mother or your natural born father but they are people that have impacted you in the kingdom of God and they have led the way for you if there's anybody in this room that's thankful for somebody who blazed a trail that you could follow would you just give a hand clap of appreciation to them Now, Paul's at a very interesting time in his life because his life is getting ready to end, and he knows it, and he's aware of it. There are some things that we, we pray that don't overtake us when it comes to death, and yet there are times that we know that it is right. And Paul is at one of these moments where he's not asking for a miracle, He's not asking to be delivered from this situation that he is in. Paul is ready. He has come to the conclusion that this is right and God is in all of this. And let me just tell you, sometimes life doesn't work out in all the ways we wish it would. And it certainly doesn't all come together, perhaps at times, the way that we wish that it would. But I do want you to know that we can have confidence that if God is in it, it's always right. Doesn't matter if you saw what you thought you needed to see, God is always right. You know, Abraham looked for a city whose builder and maker was God. Abraham didn't see that city on this side of eternity, but God was right. Elisha <clears throat> wanted a double portion of the spirit of Elijah, and you study their lives, you will find that there was, there was twice as many uh, miracles that, a, that are accounted for in the life of Elisha than there are in the life of Elijah. But that last miracle did not happen until Elisha had been dead for many, many years. And it is after his death that everything finally comes together. And so, sometimes it's the will of God that we're in the situation that we are in. Can you say amen? So Paul is on house arrest in Rome as he's writing this letter to Timothy. He is preparing to die. 
And it begs the question, what do you do when you're staring death in the face? When you know that this is the end and that you have perhaps a matter of, of hours or a matter of days or weeks and that's all that remains to you, what do you do in that moment? And I'll tell you what Paul did and I think it's what I would do and I, I hope all of us would do this. You begin to take inventory. Don't you think that'd be a wise thing to do at the end of it all? You begin to take inventory and Paul begins to look over his life and he wants to come to a conclusion on where he stands with God. Where am I with the Lord? Because when we leave this life and we go to the next life, really, that's the only important question. The, only, the important question is not what did I leave in the bank account. and The important question is not, uh, not what did I leave my kids in, in mementos. And the important question is not going to be who is going to grieve me. And the important question is not going to be how many will be at my funeral. The important question is going to be how am I with God? Where do I stand with the Lord? And so Paul is, is looking over his life and what a life it was. Oh, what a life it was. Paul, it is believed, probably was born a few years after Jesus Christ. His early life was, was somewhat unique. He was a Jew. He was a Hebrew born of the Hebrews. He was... He was of the tribe of Benjamin, he lets us know. And he was not born as Paul. He was born by the name Saul. His parents named him Saul. He was Saul, and he was Saul of Tarsus. It was the place he grew up. It was a part of Asia Minor. If, if you were in Jerusalem, uh, it would have been north of you quite a bit. And and Paul grew up, they, they, the Jews had been dispersed and all throughout the region. And Paul grew up among the dispersion of Jews that were in Tarsus. Now, just because they were not in Jerusalem or in Israel proper does not mean that he did not live for the Lord. Saul grew up in a very devoted household. He grew up with parents who showed him the ways of God. They believed very strongly what Deuteronomy said, that, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might, with all thy strength. They believed that, and they taught that to Paul. Paul would have grown up saying, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Elohimu, Adonai Ahad. He would have grown up quoting that every day. And then Saul... Um, because he was in the household that he was, he would have had parents who would have talked with him when they rose up in the morning. They would have been talking about the good things of God. And when they sat down to eat dinner, they would have been talking about the things of God. And when they laid down at night, again, they would have been talking about the things that pertained to God because they were good Jews. And this is what a good Jew did. It seems to us that perhaps Saul's life was that of growing up in the home of an upper middle class family. Not extremely wealthy, but perhaps without very much need either. So much so that they were able to take Saul, who would become Paul, and they sent him to Jerusalem as, as just probably a 12, 13, 14 year old young man. He was sent away to Jerusalem where he was trained as a Pharisee. Sitting at the feet of one of the greatest Pharisees of their time. And, and learning their ways and their customs and all of these things. He was connected. Paul was extremely connected through family. But also not only through family. That opened the door for him but his own desire for the things of God helped connect Paul to very important and influential people. 
Matter of fact, Paul tells us in his own words that as a young man, he was zealous. Everybody say zealous. He was zealous, but he had a, he had a zeal that was very particular. It wasn't just for sport. It wasn't just for, for uh, industry. Paul's zeal was for the traditions of his fathers. He wanted to grow up and be the best Jew that he could possibly be. He trained to be a Pharisee. He wanted to walk among them, and he wanted to be a thinker as they were a thinker. And when you read after Paul, you can see the amazing education that he had because he writes with a prose that no other writer in the Bible seems to really have. Paul had, Paul had this unique way with words to the point sometimes he could even be difficult to understand. He would pull from so many things, but you see the way his mind works. It's a, it's a brilliant mind, and it's a mind that has been filled with the Torah. It's been filled with those first five books of the Bible, and then, of course, he would have read after Isaiah, and he would have read after Jeremiah, and and he would have read after Ezekiel, and he would have known all of their history. He was a brilliant, brilliant young man. Brilliant. The zeal that he had was so great that Paul decided he would do anything he could to be connected and involved with squashing this, what he saw, this new thing that came along. They were calling it the way. They called it the way, and it was what we would call today Christianity. Paul saw this begin to rise. He heard the stories of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, and, and he was aware of who Jesus was. But the problem for Paul was he didn't believe that Jesus was who he claimed to be. When Jesus looked at a group of Pharisees one day and said, Before Abraham was, I am. Paul wasn't there, but I'm sure he heard about it. And I am going to tell you today that Paul certainly didn't believe when Jesus said that he was before Abraham, that he was the I am that I am. Matter of fact, Paul would have heard that and said, who does he think he is to make himself as God? That's why the priests that day took up stones to, uh, uh, that they might stone Jesus. Saul was so consumed with this Judaistic way and, and serving the Lord in the way he had been brought up to serve God. His zeal was so great that he got involved with trying to put down this revolution of people that followed the way, who followed Jesus. And so whenever Stephen was stoned in the book of Acts, and he becomes the first martyr that we read of, the Bible says that Paul, young Saul at that time, held the coats of those as they took their coats off and began to take up their rocks and they stoned Stephen. Paul said, I'll hold your coats for you. I'm too young to be involved with it as you are, but I will hold your coats while you stone this horrible blasphemer of the things of God. And thank the Lord that there was a Stephen there who said, don't hold this sin to their charge. He said, Lord, what's happening to me right now is not right. And what's happening to me right now is not the way it ought to be. But God, I'm asking you, they just don't understand yet, Lord. Please don't hold this sin to their charge. If he had not prayed that prayer, I wonder if we ever would have had an Apostle Paul. I just want to tell you, Jesus told us, he said, don't, don't, whenever people speak all manner of evil against you, don't revile them. Don't try to stand up against them. You just keep your mouth shut and you keep on loving them and you keep on doing what is right. You don't have to prove yourself right. You don't have to defend yourself. I've told people before, if anybody's ever running this pastor down, you don't need to go defend me. You just tell them you love them and pray for them. 
You don't have to defend me. I'm not going to defend me. God's got his hand on all of it. Let's just pray, Lord, don't lay this sin to their charge because sometimes the one that's cursing you is the same one that if you just give them a little bit of time, God's going to give revelation to them and God's going to use them. That is what happened with Paul. He gets more and more involved with this. It seems like, you know, everybody's got their ministry. And it seems like Paul's ministry among, among the Pharisees and the groups that he is running with, his ministry is that he's going to be the one that's going to persecute the Christians, the Christians, Christians. So Paul begins to do all that he can. It happens in Jerusalem. But when they begin to move out, Paul takes letters, the Bible said. He goes to the chief priests, and he is so connected among the chief priests, ladies and gentlemen, that he gets letters from them that allow him to go to Damascus, where he is going to have the Christians seized and brought back to stand trial. And so he has his letters, he is on his beast, and he gets on the road. And he's on the Damascus road. And as he is on that Damascus road, the Bible said that suddenly there was a bright light that shone and it knocked him from his animal. And Paul lays on the ground and he hears this voice that says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Don't you know it's going to be difficult for you to keep doing what you're doing. You're never going to win at what you're doing, Saul. Why do you keep on persecuting me? And Saul, realizing that this is not the voice of any ordinary man, matter of fact, in his own testimony, Paul will later tell us that he had come face to face with Jesus Christ himself. He said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. And when Saul hears this, he knows this is no magic show. This is nothing, this is nothing that is just some kind of a, this, some kind of a, a, a unique experience that's coming out of some man who's being, what do you call a, a, a ventriloquist who's, who's talking from one place, but it's acting like it's coming from somewhere else. He knows that this is a supernatural experience, that it is God Almighty himself. And Saul says, you tell me what to do, Lord, and I'll do it. And he goes on to Damascus, and there the Lord uses some people to bring him to truth. Aren't you glad that God brings us to truth? He said, I'm going to help you. So he goes. He's converted. They begin, to, they begin to instruct him in the way. Now what's unique about Paul with all of this is that Paul is so learned in Scripture that Paul begins to say when they tell him Jesus is the mighty God in Christ. Jesus told those Pharisees before Abraham was I am. Saul is now without the blinders on. Saul is able to reach into that Old Testament and into the New Testament. And he begins to see how it comes together. And so he gives us 13 epistles that are so wonderfully written that instruct us in the ways of living for God and helping us to understand who Jesus Christ is. I've got to tell you, Jesus is not Jehovah Jr. Jesus is not a second person in a Godhead. But the Bible said the fullness of the Godhead dwelleth in him bodily. Jesus Christ is God Almighty, robed in flesh. He is not a part of God, but he is the fullness of God incarnate. Jesus is God. Paul now understands this. He, he begins to put pen to paper and instruct us to know this more beautifully. He spends 10 years at Antioch where he is 
where he is trained and he is taught and he is he learns how to be a servant and he learns that he's got to stand down every once in a while because Paul had a very strong uh, personality. Paul had a personality that was very out front and he was very sure of himself, but now he's got to spend some time submitted to some elders who can help him to understand some things. And he grows, and oh, does he grow. He grows in God in such a beautiful and wonderful way. Eventually, Paul enters into ministry and he becomes a missionary to the Gentiles. Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. It is my personal belief. I, I can't, and I've talked about it before. I won't argue it with you. I can't, I can't definitively prove it to you. But the Bible does say that the, uh, the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb are written in the foundation stones of heaven, of that new Jerusalem. And I believe that when Judas left his place, the Bible said they cast lots and Matthias was chosen as the 12th disciple to fill Judas's place. That's what man did. I am personally of the opinion that the Apostle Paul is the 12th apostle of the Lamb. Because to be an apostle of the Lamb, you had to see Jesus. And Paul, by his own account, saw Jesus on the Damascus Road. Whether that be or not, it doesn't take away from the fact that he was the apostle of the Gentiles. And Paul went among them, and you've got many books of your Bible. You've got Corinthians, and you've got Thessalonians, and you've got Philemon, and you've got all these others, Galatians and Romans, and all these books in your Bible that are written by Paul that are to churches that he helped establish, the Philippian church in Philippi that he helped establish. He had quite a ministry, ladies and gentlemen. He went into places and there was uproars and he went into places and there were uprisings, but he also went into places and there were conversions and he went into places and they burned their books on the occult and they burned their books on witchcraft and the, the sum of it was in the millions of dollars today, but Paul went in and he changed cities with the gospel of Jesus Christ. He was powerful in word. He was powerful in deed. God worked miracles by the hands of Paul. But greater than the miracles that he did for physical lives was what Paul did when he opened up his mouth. When he walked on places like Mars Hill and he said, you've got a statue up here to every God. You've got the sun God and you've got the moon God and you've got the stars God and you've got the tree gods and you've got the this God and you've got that God. He said, matter of fact, y'all are so superstitious you don't want to leave one out, so you even built a statue here to the unknown God. And they had. And on Mars Hill, Paul said, let me declare him to you. You don't know him, but I do. You don't know his name, but I know his name. His name is Jesus. He is the Christ. He is the Messiah. And Paul began to expound unto them who Jesus was. And, and, and I'm just telling you, he had a powerful ministry. Now, he could also preach a long time. The Bible tells us in the book of Acts that Paul got to preaching one night. And he got so long-winded that there was a young man sitting up in the window listening to him. And as Paul, the more Paul preached, the more he started getting sleepy. And Paul kept going, and this young man kept trying, but he couldn't hold on too terribly long. And finally, after Paul had gone a while, that young man fell asleep and promptly fell out the window and died. He fell on the ground from a high place and hit the ground so hard that it killed him. And Paul went down and laid hands on him and prayed for him and God brought him back to life. That's pretty amazing, ain't it? But it's what Paul, go ahead. But it's what Paul did next that I really love. He went upstairs and started preaching again. My kind of guy. 
You talk about a ministry. It wasn't always just with words, though. He did look at them one day and said, let me just tell y'all something. He said, I gave you words and words and words, but finally I determined to know nothing among you but Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And he said, the day came where I had to come to you, and I didn't come with enticing words of man's wisdom, but I came in demonstration of God's Spirit and power. He wasn't just a good preacher, but Paul knew how to flow in the Holy Ghost. And I'm going to tell you, we don't need one or the other. We need both and. We don't just need preaching. We need spirit. We need people who can bring the two together. Paul knew how to do that. He had quite a ministry. So I've, I've walked you through Paul's early life. I've walked you through Paul's conversion. I've walked you a little bit through Paul's ministry that took him all over their little then known world and, and Asia Minor and all the places that he went. You ought to look in the back of your Bible sometime and look at the maps that contain the missionary journeys of Paul. It's pretty amazing. He traveled far and wide to preach this gospel. And he started as a young man, not down on that Damascus road. But now, in the scripture that I've read to you today, he is an old man. And he is, he is at the end of his life, and he knows that it's all coming to an end. And so he's been taking inventory. And I can only imagine that Paul is sitting there thinking about what it was like. I remember being that young man. Lord, if you knock me off my mule today, it'd, I'd probably break a hip and I'd die right there. But Lord, I was a young man that day and you knocked me off my animal and you showed me who you were. And I'll never forget what you did for me, God. And I'm so thankful that you didn't let me keep going in error. I'm so glad you sent somebody to preach the gospel to me. And I'm going to tell you right now, don't you ever uh, underestimate how wonderful it is that you've had people get up in front of you and preach the gospel of Jesus to you. Do you know how blessed you are? Do you know how blessed you are? Do you understand? Do you understand how blessed you are to have what you have, to know what you know and understand what you understand? Paul must have been thinking about it. He probably thought about those days in Tarsus where he's running around. Thought about the, I'm going to ask, we, we try to lower our moving around, please, this morning. He's thinking about all these people that, that God's used to bring him to where he is. The, the life he lived as a child running around Tarsus. And all of these things. And now where he's at. And Paul said, I've, I've looked back over it. I've taken inventory. I'm looking at where I stand with God. And Paul said, Timothy, I'm an old man, but I'd like to say something to you, a young man who's going to continue on after me. Timothy, here is my conclusion. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Timothy, I didn't quit. Timothy, I didn't stop. Matter of fact, Timothy, I've been shipwrecked. I've been beaten. I've been stoned. I've had people lie on me. I've had people hurt me. I've had people betray me. I've had people turn away from me. I've had people do this. I've had people do that. But Timothy, I never quit on God. I was shipwrecked. I spent a day and a night in the deep, and I never quit then. I got up. I drifted to shore. I walked up. I dried myself off, and I said, where to now, Lord? And I kept on going. Timothy, I kept fighting. Timothy, I kept fighting. Timothy, I didn't stop. Timothy, I wouldn't quit. Timothy, I kept this fight going. Somebody shout, I fought a good fight. You can be seated. Paul said, that's what I did. I'm an old man, Timothy, but I want to tell you something, young man. I fought a good fight. I, did, I never, nobody has to be embarrassed about how I fought, Timothy. Nobody's got to hang their head about how I fought. I'm not going into eternity with my head 
turn sideways. I'm not going into eternity, going to stand at judgment and try to slip off to the side and hope the Lord don't notice me. I'm going to go in with my head held high, Timothy. I'm going to go in saying I can, I can stand here confident that I gave it my best. I did everything I can. And when the devil came around, I didn't back up, Timothy. When the devil told me to give up, I didn't quit, Timothy. When the enemy said, I'm going to stop you, I just said, you do your best, but I'm going to keep on preaching what I've been preaching. And Timothy, I got up and I preached again. And Timothy, I got up and I declared Jesus again. (laughs) Timothy, I finished my course. I finished my course. God laid something out for me to do. God gave me a ministry. Everybody say a ministry. God gave me a ministry, Timothy. It was mine. I fought a good fight. It's a fight. But when he talks about his course, he said, it's my course. I finished my course. I got up and I did what I needed to be doing. I, 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 was, I was consistent. The ministry that God gave me, I held on to it. I did not let go of it. I, I would get up day after day after day and I would be consistent. And doing what God called me to do. If I knew that I was getting on a boat that was about to be shipwrecked, I got on the boat anyway. Because God told me to get on the boat. If I knew that there was a time in the Bible where Paul was preaching, getting ready to go somewhere. And and a prophet came walking in and tied his hands. And he said, this is what they're going to do to the man whose hands I've tied when he gets there. And all the people started crying and wailing, saying, Paul, don't go. Don't go, Paul, don't go. And Paul said, would you have me do what you want me to do? Or would you have me to do the will of God? You can ask me not to go, but I'm going anyway because I have a course. I have a ministry. And I am going to finish my course. And third, Paul said, Timothy, I kept the faith. Mm. Timothy, I didn't water it down one bit. Timothy, I didn't let go of one thing. Timothy, I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. Timothy, I was raised at the feet of the best. Timothy, if anybody ever knew how to be a good Jew, I knew how to be a good Jew. But when God converted me and he brought me into this marvelous light, I want you to know I didn't let go. I held on to one God, Timothy. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. I held on to it, Timothy. I never got moved off of it. I never got distracted from it. It never became old to me. It never did not matter to me. Let me just tell you, you need to always make sure you're in a church who understands who God is, who understands who Jesus is. Not all churches preach the same thing. There's only one Lord. There's only one faith. There's only one baptism. You better hold that. You better not let go of that. It's all in Him. It's all in Him. The fullness of the Godhead. It's all in Him. Paul knew who Jesus was. That the Jesus of the new is the Jehovah of the old. I said the Jesus of the new is the Jehovah of the old. Paul said, I kept that faith. He said, let me tell you something else. He said, whenever I understood and it was showed to me, He said, I understood the pattern that God gave in the wilderness. It was blood in Egypt. It was water at Red Sea. It was spirit of cloud whenever he took uh, Israel through the wilderness. He said it was blood at the altar. It was water at the labor. It was spirit in the holy place. He said, I understood all that. And Jesus, when he died, it was death, blood at the the cross. It was uh, burial in, in water in the grave and he said it was resurrection it was spirit new life when he came up out of that grave he said i saw that pattern and i want you to know i held that pattern there's only one way to be born again you've got to be born again of the water and of the spirit you've got to be born again of the water and of the spirit you got to die to yourself you got to be buried in baptism in Jesus' name. And you've got to be filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. That is how we are born again. 
Paul held on to the faith. Paul didn't let go of the faith. He said, this is the faith once delivered to the saints. This is what's going to get us to, to glory. And this is why Paul is confident at the end of his life because he has kept the faith. He said, I, I, he said, I believe that we're supposed to be a separate people. He said, we've got to come out from among them and be ye separate. God never had a people that was not separate. God never had a people look like everybody else. God never had a people acted like everybody else. God never had a people that worshiped like everybody else. God never had a people that called on multiple gods like everybody else. He said he called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. He said, I've held on to it. And Paul gives us so much of our understanding of holiness comes from the apostle Paul. Sanctification, Paul preaches it. Righteousness, Paul preaches it. All of these things, Paul said, I'm free from the blood of any man. I have not shunned to declare the whole gospel of God unto you. You're a young man. I'm an old man. Timothy, listen to what I say. I have kept the faith. I've kept the faith. Paul said to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 9 and 24, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but only one receives the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run. Not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Paul said it's like running a race, and that not everybody's going to finish that race and win it. But you need to run it like you want to be the one to win it. He said, and I ran. And I didn't run uncertainly. What he means is, I didn't run if the, if the finish line was over there. He said, I didn't detour over here. He said, I ran if the finish line was over there. He said, I didn't come over here to skip rocks. He said, the finish line was over there. He said, I didn't go backwards. He said, the finish line was over there. I didn't try to make the finish line be over there, and I didn't try to make it be over there. He said, I set my eyes on the prize. I looked to Jesus. He's the author. He's the finisher of my faith. He said, and I ran. I didn't run zigzag. I ran in a straight line. I got there, and I gave it all that I had. He said, I fought. He said, we fight. We fight. We fight. Somebody shout, we fight. He said, so fight I. But I don't fight like somebody that's just shadow boxing. I'm not fighting like this don't matter. I'm not fighting like, look at me, aren't I something? Look at me. I, I want to do something, but y'all going to think I'm so silly. What's that? <laughs> he said, I'm not, what's he, I'm not up here trying to show you how, co how good I look when I'm fighting. He said, I'm not fighting that kind of fight. He said, when I fight, brother, I fight. He said, the devil don't want to come around me because he's liable to get a black eye. There, there no spirit of depression want to come around me because it's liable to get kicked in the teeth. He said, I've been fighting for a long time and I didn't fight like I didn't know what I was doing. I fought like I had purpose. I fought like I was going to get somewhere. Come on. Somebody shout. And he looked at Timothy and he said, Timothy, let me just tell you what I need to say to you. He said, Timothy, I'm the old man. You're the young man. Sit up and listen to me. I got somewhat to say to you. Timothy, preach the word. We need preachers that will preach the word. We don't need people to preach their opinion. We don't need people to preach social norms. We don't need people to preach what the government's saying. We don't need people to preach what whatever else is saying. We need people that get up and preach this book. This book is still God's word. This book is still right. Oh, hallelujah. Be seated. 
This book is right. This book is right. Well, let me tell I don't know. We've got so much science now. This book has never disagreed with true science. You sound like an old-fashioned preacher right now. Well, you just buckle up, buttercup, because I'm I, I going to say a few things. This book is right. When they didn't believe, when they did not believe that the earth was round, and there's still some don't believe it, the Bible said, He sitteth upon the circle of the earth. This book's been right for a long time. Whenever they got to telling us this is how the solar system operates, this book was saying, nope, it don't go that way. And you know what? Over time, they found out the book was right. Why are you getting in all that? Because I'm telling you, we got to preach this word. Because we got a culture out there right now that's saying a lot of things. And we love all people. And I will shake your hand, and I will hug your neck. I don't care what lifestyle you come out of. I don't care what you've been a part of. I will love on you, and this church will show kindness to you. But I'm going to tell you, transgenderism is not right. It's wrong. Homosexuality is not right. It's wrong. How do you know? Because the Bible said. The Bible said. The Word of God said. And forever, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Thy word is settled. Not one jot, not one tittle the scripture said is going to pass away that God won't cause it to be fulfilled. God's word is true. God's word is right. You've got to preach the word, Timothy. Don't preach how to win friends and influence people, though you need to win friends and influence people. But when you preach, you preach the Word. Preach the Word. Timothy, you've got to teach no other doctrine. Timothy, I gave you a doctrine. Teach no other doctrine. Why not? Because this doctrine is the doctrine that was once delivered to the saints. There is no other way, Timothy. God... God uh, struck me down. It took me a lot of years to pull all of this together. And now I've given it to you in letters and epistles. And Timothy, you have Bible doctrine. Hold on to the doctrine. Timothy, be instant. Be ready. Be ready to move. Be ready to go. You never know when you're going to be called on, Timothy. There's going to be somebody somewhere. And you could be called on at any moment in time. And God's going to need you. We were walking through the mall in Indianapolis this weekend. Uh, it would have been Friday afternoon. We were in the mall. And, and uh, as, as Asher and I sat outside on a, on a bench waiting for our ladies to finish shopping. Actually, Asher had been shopping. And I had been shopping. But I was shopping for cookies. And we were sitting out there, and this, this mall cop came up to us, and she said, I'm a mall cop. And she said, uh, she was an older lady, and it was the old woman wanted to talk to the young man. He's out helping Pastor Clinton right now at the park. The old woman wanted to talk to the young man. She was old. I don't even think she had her teeth in that day. I'm not kidding. I'm not trying to be funny. She, oh, she could watch this. That's right. Gloria, that's not a knock on you. She was the sweetest thing. Gloria comes along. She says, young man, I want to tell you something. She said, dad's going to back me up. I said, say on, sister. And she said, you need to do good in school. And, you need, and she started telling him about it. You need to do this and you need to do that and you need to. And, and you need to listen to your parents. And then she looked at me. Right, Dad? I said, yes, ma'am. You tell him. And she's just telling him how he needs to do and be. And, and she was right on the money. She's just laying it out. And, I'm, and I was behind her, amen, and the whole time. It was a good message. And, and she, so, so here it goes, and all this stuff happens. And, and we talked for, talk for a while. And... Uh, my wife comes out, and Nora comes out, and, and she starts talking to them. 
And as she was talking to Asher, she said, she said something, and she said, Cause we don't walk, we don't just walk uh, by sight. And I said, and I said, no, ma'am, we walk by faith. And she went. And she said, what do you do? <laughs> I said, I'm a pastor. She said, ooh, I knew you were a pastor. She said, he got it. She looked at Ashley. She said, he got it. We sat there and began to talk. And, and, and before you knew it, it started with her ministering to Asher, but it ended with us ministering to her that day. You know what I was talking about? Be instant. And glory, I do hope you're watching this. She said she was going to look us up and watch us. Glory, I pray God blesses you and touches you and heals your body more. I know you're down from that stroke, but let God touch you in the name of Jesus. Matter of fact, would you just raise your hands, church, right now? Pray for glory. Lord, touch Gloria right now. Wherever she is, I pray you'd strengthen her body. I pray you'd help her and bless her. In the name of Jesus. And when it was all said and done, I found out she had come out of Bishop G.T. Haywood's church, Christ Temple in Indianapolis, Indiana, a, long, a lot of years ago. And we got to encourage her in the Lord. Isn't that great? What are you talking about? I'm talking about be instant. Be ready. You don't know. You never know when you're going to walk into Walmart and God's going to need you to touch somebody. You never know when you're going to walk into your classroom at school and you're going to have a friend that needs to be encouraged, that needs you to preach to them a little. Be instant. Be ready. 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 Endure afflictions, Timothy. You're going to go through some things. You're going, to have to, you're going to go through some stuff. Is there anybody in this room that's lived for God 40 years or more? Would you raise your hand? 40 years or more. Keep them up if you can. And again, that's not a joke. Look around, folks. Look around all these hands. If there's anybody in this room that's lived for God 40 years or more, you can put them down. If there's anyone that's lived for God 40 years or more, and listen to me carefully, and you've never had anything to go through, you've never had an affliction, you've never had a sickness, you've never had a difficult day, you've never had to bury a loved one, you've never had to walk through trouble, would you raise your hand? Not a single hand. You know why? Because everybody's going to have affliction. But Paul said, I'm the old man, you the young man. Listen to me. Endure afflictions. That means keep on going anyway. Get up and say, I got to keep living for God. It don't matter if I don't feel good today. It don't matter if I'm discouraged today. It don't matter if I'm offended today. I've got to live for God. He said, be an example. He said, hold fast. This is what the old man said to the young man. And I'm just going to tell you, he was not the only one in Scripture who did it. He is not the only one because not only did Paul encourage uh, Timothy, but David encouraged Solomon. Elijah encouraged Elisha. Moses encouraged Joshua. And if I could boil it all down to one thing, to what they said, it would be three simple words. It would, whether it's Paul talking or Moses talking or Elijah talking or David, don't matter who it is, you can boil it all down to three words. Are y'all ready? Here's what the old man said to the young man. Finish this race. Finish this race. Keep serving God. Keep loving people. Keep raising your family in the things of God. Keep coming to church. Keep paying your tithes. Keep being faithful. Keep looking for ways to help people. Keep, keep, keep looking for ways to bless others. Keep worshiping the Lord. Keep magnifying the Lord. Do whatever you got to do, but don't you dare quit. Finish this race. Finish. And here's the beautiful thing about the race, Grandma. I was thinking about you a while ago when I was preaching up there. And I got to thinking about Paul and where all God brought him from. God brought you from a mighty long way too. And if she's told me once, she's told me a hundred times. 
about being in the backyard over by the rock wall fence and praying and saying, if there's God, if there is a God in heaven, would you, would you please tell me, please show me, help me. That's what it was. Help me. Little girl, little girl. And she said, if there's a God, please help me and take me to a better place. And she said, and he brought me to a better place. He, she said, he brought me all the way from Mexico to America. And she said, he didn't just change. He didn't just change that, but he changed my country. Amen. He didn't just change my spiritual condition. He changed my country. She said, he changed my language. She said, he changed everything about me. And what a mighty long way God's brought us from. And grandma, now you are 80... 84. 84. We'll ask mom. She'll tell us. She tells me everything too. I can't get up here and preach and tell a story without her trying to correct me over there. 84 years old. It's been a long time. Been living for Jesus. But grandma, don't quit. Finish this race. Finish this race. Brother Leon. Do you remember how old you were when your family came into, into the church? You were 21 when your family, and today you're 94. Correct, sister? 94, 95 in September. 18 when you came into the church. And now you're 95. Been a lot of years been a lot of water under the bridge been a lot of trouble been a lot of trials oh, yeah. been a lot of afflictions Everybody been a lot of help. things Everybody. but it's been worth it <laughs> but it's been worth it <laughs> brother sister Goolsby how old were you when you came into the church brother Goolsby 19 you mind if I ask your age I just did I guess 84. Three. We're all getting corrected today. Join the club. We're all getting corrected. 83. Been living for God a lot of years. Started with nothing, but God kept His hand on you and blessed you, brought you a mighty long way. Let me just tell you, all over this room, we got testimonies just like that. All over this room, there's people, and I would never want to embarrass them, but let me just tell you, there's people that have been beaten by husbands. You hear me? There's people that's been disowned by family. There's people that's been left by wives. There's people that's been cast aside by friends. There's people that's gone through a whole lot of things. But it's been worth it all. It's been worth it all. Let me just tell you, God's been, God's been there every step of the way. Just because you went through a tough day and a dark night doesn't mean God wasn't there. Finish this race. We come too far to stop now. Finish this race. You're young. Y'all aren't old yet. But should the Lord tarry and your health hold out, one of these days you will be. And you remember your pastor standing in front of you on this Sunday. I hope it gets seared into your minds. Pastor walked off the platform. Came over to us in the youth group. And pastor said, finish this race. Finish this race. So get to running. But don't run in circles. And don't run in zigzags. Run toward the author. Toward the finisher. Keep running till you get to heaven. Run through your trouble. Run through your trials. Run through your pain. Run through your heartache. Run through your circumstances. Run through your confusion. Run through your offense. Run, 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 run. Keep on running. Keep on running. Keep on running. Because one of these days, you're going to get to heaven. One of these days, it's going to be worth it all. It's going to be worth it all. It's going to be worth it all. Some beautiful, happy day. Going to be worth every long mile, every heartache, and every trial. 
It's gonna be worth it all to beautiful happy day. We said it's gonna be worth it all. It's gonna be worth it all. It's gonna be worth it all to beautiful happy day. Gonna be worth every long mile, every heartache, and every trial. It's gonna be worth it all. Y'all don't have to sing that. I just went there. So I want you to step out from where you are today if you'd like to. No, you don't have to. But anybody that'd like to, I'd like you to step out from where you are. Come to the front of this church. And I don't care how old you are. In the eyes of Paul, we're all young. And if you're in this room today... I just wonder if you'd make a commitment that said, Paul, Elijah, Moses, M.L. Moore, George Glass Sr., James Kilgore. Some of y'all don't know who I'm talking about, but some of you do. G.A. Mangan, J.T. Pugh, whoever you need to call out. I wonder if you just say, I just came to the front of the church today to tell you I'm still running and I plan on finishing. And if that's you, I just wish you'd put your hands in the air and you'd begin to make a commitment before God. I'm not giving up. I'm not quitting. I'm not stopping. I'm not turning around. I'm going to keep running. I'm going to keep fighting. I've got a course. I've got the faith. I'm going to keep going until it's all done. this altar call a little differently than we normally do. Today I'd like to end this altar call with us just going to one another and just looking another person in the eye and saying, Brother Johnny, you can make it. You can make it. Finish this race. Would you just reach around today and I, I just want you to start encouraging brothers and sisters. Encourage a guest. Just tell them, say, finish this race. Tell somebody, finish this race.
They start serving food at one o'clock, pavilions three and four. Join us out there. We're going to have a good time. We're going to pray a couple prayer calls. I need, a, I need some ministers to come pray with me.